Professor Barton, thank you for the visit in my home office. You are a professor for interpretation of the Holy Scripture at the Oriel College in Oxford from 1991 to 2014. And since 2007, you are fellow of the British Academy. And since 2008, foreign member of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences. You have written a very, very interesting book called A History of the Bible. The book and its face, which had been just published by in, German, in Germany by Klett Cotta under the title Die Geschichte der Bibel von den Ursprüngen bis in die Gegenwart. Um, for this book, um, translated by Jens Hackstedt and Karin Schuler. For this book, you have received the years in this year, the Duff Cooper Prize. Your book is a whole program. It is a complete presentation of the Bible from its origin, its structure, its reception and interpretation. I mean the interpretation up to our time. Do these topics belong together? Or do you think there are focal points, topics which you want particularly to emphasize? Well, I think I wanted to provide a complete history of the Bible from its beginnings till now. And that, of course, involved the history of interpretation, which is quite complicated. Um, but there is a kind of uniting thread or theme, which is the sense that both Judaism and Christianity, though they both claim to be rooted in the Bible, uh, aren't identical with the Bible. They're, that They are both religions which relate to the Bible rather obliquely rather than in a straightforward, direct manner. And that means that at various times in the history of interpretation, both Christians and Jews have had to read the Bible as though it said what they believe, even though sometimes it doesn't say exactly what they believe. And that's a, a uniting theme, I think, which runs through the whole book and is an attempt to, to tie together all this very disparate and complicated material. Mm -hmm. When one reads your book, it, it is immediately noticeable that it is by no means directed only by um, for theologians, but also for philosophers, historians, and above all, literary scholars. Is this right? Yes, that's right. I very much wanted to write a book which wasn't just for theologians. I've written a lot of books for theologians, but um, I think that I wanted this to address, and Penguin, who commissioned the book, wanted me to address a wider public. And it's meant for anyone interested in the Bible who's willing to read 600 pages. I mean, clearly, that means someone with a serious intellectual interest, but not necessarily someone who's either a believer or still more a practitioner of theology, rather anyone with a general intellectual interest in this monument of Western and to some extent Eastern civilization. Mm -hmm. You begin with a quotation from the Canadian literary critic, Northrop Fry, who spoke of the Bible I quote, as an important element of our own poetic tradition. Is it possible that some people have forgotten this literary aspect of the Bible? I think it is true. I noticed that in uh, lectures on English literature and indeed modern language literature, both in Britain and in the US, lecturers now sometimes find it necessary to provide some information about the Bible because students no longer have a basic biblical knowledge. They, they've never done a sort of Bibelkunde course of any kind, and so they don't know their way around the Bible, and they don't realize often how crucial and central it is to Western literature. So I wanted to help to inform people in that bracket that, that um, the Bible is worth reading, and also, of course, to emphasize that it's worth reading anyway, that it's an interesting work in its own right, but certainly important as a major influence on Western literature. One of the first chapters is called Modern Reconstructions, which deals with the creation of the Old Testament. How does knowledge of the origins of these texts contribute to understand the Bible? Well, that's a bit hard to say, because um, one can, of course, understand the Bible just as it is treated as it were almost as if it were a modern text, but it seems to me quite important to have some knowledge 
of the background of how it came to be, as with any text, and one would do the same if one was studying Homer, say, that one can study Homer as wonderful poetic work in its own right. But one also fairly soon starts to say to oneself, when was this written? What were the circumstances that gave rise to a work like this? And the same arises, I think, with the Bible, with both Old and New Testaments. But people do have a curiosity about how we got these books. And knowledge of that is very, very poorly disseminated in our culture, either in Britain or in Germany. I think that people in general don't know anything about how the Bible came to be. And my hope was that I could interest them in it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you describe the goal of your book? Um, how you would call your book? It's a textbook or a result of research. For example, chapter two, Hebrew Thoughts provides knowledge that goes um, really beyond of a normal Bible reader. Well, that's true, of course. Um, it's not meant to be a textbook in the sense that it's not meant for students of theology, primarily. Though I have a sense it may become one, perhaps, that, that might be its ultimate fate um, to become a part of the syllabus. Um, but the object of it, as I said, is really to appeal to the general educated public, not to theology students particularly, um, who are interested in how the Bible came about and how it's been read. Mm -hmm. So the purpose is not really to provide a textbook, but a, a book for the general reader. I, I took a little persuading by Penguin that there were general readers who would read 600 pages But they told me there are, and it seems that is the case because it's been read quite widely. Um, mm. But you could argue that I provide more information than an ordinary vowel reader needs. That is, of course, true, but um, the amount of material one needs is of not a fixed quantity. It's a variable amount, depending on who's doing the instructing and who's doing the reading. And I, I judged that that amount of information was possibly of interest the general reader, it wouldn't be enough for someone doing a course in Old or New Testament studies, who would then have to refer to much more de detailed works. Um, is the Bible a moral book? Does it make rules? I'm thinking of, the, of your chapter, Law and Wisdom, among mm -hmm. others, but they different, dif differentiate between rules and wisdom. I call the chapter um, sceptical wisdom, or personalized wisdom, uh, or also the Ten Commandments and motivations for great, for good behavior. Well, the Bible does provide quite a lot of moral advice and, and, and orders. The Ten Commandments are, as we say, apodictic. They're, they're, they're categorical demands. Um, but there's plenty of other material in the Bible which is ethical in, in, quality, in character. Um, so many of the narratives are told to exemplify good or bad conduct, good or way, good, bad ways of acting. Now, of course, in Judaism, the norm is to treat the whole of the Hebrew Bible as, in a sense, instruction, Torah, which means advice on how to live a good life. Mm -hmm. um, Christians have tended not to be so, so interested in that because they've had a often an interested in messianic prophecy as what the Bible is about. But nevertheless, Christians too have seen important moral principles in the, Bible, in the Hebrew Bible. And of course, also in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, or the teachings of Paul, they've seen instruction for living a good life there. Um, so I think the Bible is a moral book in that sense. Of course, there are ways in which the Bible can be described as an immoral book, in that it sometimes describes ways of life that are not commended, but uh, actually deplored. And some of its instruction strikes us as harsh, uh, all the large number of offenses for which the death penalty is prescribed, for example, doesn't mm -hmm. suit modern sensibilities at all. But I think it is moral in the sense that it does have a lot to say about morality. Mm -hmm. uh, no doubt you want to encourage your readers to read the Bible again. But it is also about emphasizing his modern character. How do you find this in the Bible? Modern character? Well, I think it's that, like any 
really serious work of literature, any non-trivial work of literature, it resonates differently in different ages. And it can still resonate in the modern period. If, if it's read sensitively, one can find ways in which it, for example, exposes human nature and the general human condition. Uh, and it can illuminate our moral decisions in various ways, uh, not necessarily through its original intentions, but sometimes because in a new age, a great text comes alive in a new way. And one might think again of Homer or Greek tragedies or of Shakespeare or of Goethe, that they're not, they are of their age, but they're more than of their age. They, they actually have a resonance for each new generation, which has to discover them anew. And my attempt in this book is to persuade people to discover the Bible afresh. Mm -hmm. um, the history of the Bible is also a history of its, of its interpretation, which is so inseparably connected with it. Indeed, it's part of its core. Yes, I think um, the history is clearly not just a history of how the Bible came to be written and then translated, but also how it came to be received. And of course, in the humanities generally, reception history is quite popular and important at the moment. People ask themselves about, again, to go back to Shakespeare, they ask not just what Shakespeare was saying, but how Shakespeare has been understood and look at you know, the 18th century reception of Shakespeare and things of that kind. And similarly in biblical studies, we're in a phase at the moment in which scholars are very interested in how the Bible's been received and interpreted. And this was my contribution to that. I don't have very much on the reception in art or music, neither of which I know that much about, but I, at least I had some things on, some points to make on the reception in direct biblical interpretation through commentary work and perhaps also th through avenues such as liturgy. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the history of the text is also the history of its reception. Mm -hmm. Now I have the same question a bit from another angle of view. The genesis of the Bible is a process which, which because it is always finding new readers is still going on. Mm, yes, I think that's very true. Uh, the Bible has not ended yet, I think. It's the, <laughs> well, sometimes, of course, people say to me, surely there's no more to be said about the Bible. It's 2000 years old and by now everything must have been explored. But that isn't true. It is That is true of trivial texts, but it isn't true of important deep ones such as the Bible. Mm -hmm. We keep finding new things in it. Even your preface contains remarkable insights that set the tone for its book, I quote, neither Judaism or nor Christianity can be read from the Bible, although both religions claimed biblical, um, biblical books as their foundation. For whom was the Bible or its text written at that time? Well, I, my point there really is that, um, of course, for uh, the beginnings of Judaism, there was as yet no Bible. And for the beginnings of Christianity, there was as yet no Bible. The early Christians, such as Paul, didn't have a, uh, a New Testament to appeal to. They were in the process of writing it. Um, and so I don't think it's, I think it's true to say that the Bible was a product of Christianity and Judaism, mm -hmm. rather than the foundation document of those religions. They claim it now as their foundation document, but in origin, it's a product of the religion rather than a foundation for it. And that was a point I wanted to stress. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that you can't, as I said, read off Christianity or Judaism. If you were presented with the Bible, you wouldn't predict, in the scientific sense of predict, Judaism or Christianity as we now have them, just from the text of the Bible. And equally from Judaism and Christianity as we now know them, you wouldn't predict that their foundation document would be this particular book. There's a lack of exact fit between the two. Mm -hmm. But they were produced, the two testaments both produced as a way of distilling the most important aspects of the two religions. Mm -hmm. What about the phrase, the sentences inspired by God? Does this also apply to the New Testament? 
Well, the, the, the phrase inspired by God literally occurs only once in the whole Bible. That's in 2 Timothy, a, a letter which is probably not by Paul at all. Um, and it says all scripture is inspired by God. And that is a reference clearly to what we call the Old Testament, since there was as yet no New Testament. But Christians, of course, have extended it. And the idea that the Bible is inspired doesn't just depend on a, a single text. It depends on a whole perception of it as saying more than human beings could have produced uh, under their own initiative and seeing the hand of God somehow in the coming to be of this book. Now, so many of the things I've said in, in my book make that perhaps rather harder to maintain. I stress how disparate and complicated the book is and how, um, as it were, if you were expecting God to give you a document, you wouldn't expect him to give you this one, which is so complex and intricate and shows so many signs of human reasoning and understanding. Mm -hmm. But there are ways in which one can continue to talk about the Bible as inspired. One formula I use in the book is that the Bible tells us things we can't tell ourselves. Now that's true in the sense of all great literature that great writers tell us things we couldn't have told ourselves, though we often then re recognize them as true. But that may seem a rather thin basis for a doctrine of inspiration, and I think it probably is. I don't myself find myself using the word inspiration very often when talking about the Bible, though I think it's a great and very important work. Mm -hmm. I want to speak with you about the biblical scholarship in the presentation of your research. What are the decisive questions for them? What are the open points? Well, I've appealed mostly to what's nowadays normally called historical critical scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, which asks about origins and foundations and the coming to be of the text. And I've not done much in the way of what's now sometimes called canonical interpretation, where you say, let's simply look at the text as it lies before us and see what it might mean. Um, for me, the historical questions are still the interesting ones. And that's why the book is a history of the Bible rather than an interpretation of the Bible. But The other questions are very current in biblical studies, where there's a great interest in how the Bible functions in its final form, its present form, and also many other features, such as what it can tell us about social history of biblical peoples and uh, what it has to contribute to debates about inclusivity and tolerance and so on. Um, but for me, the historical questions predominate, and that hence the title of the book. Mm -hmm. In contrast to the Islam, Christianity is not a religion of scripture that concentrates on a holy work. And so that you call the Bible a colorful collection of materials. Mm -hmm. What is, what, um, is to be um, believed is not even mentioned on it. Uh, yes, I, I, I mean, the Quran is the, Islam is the parade example, the typical example of a real religion of the book, where the Quran is everything in a sense, and is, is, is very totally central, and the whole religion centers around it. Um, in either Judaism or Christianity, as I tried to say, the relationship is slightly more oblique than that. Both are religions of the book, in a sense. I mean, the Bible is very important for both of them. But um, they're not purely scriptural religions. There's a great deal in Judaism, which any Jewish person will quite happily acknowledge are not to be found directly in the scripture. Some of the ritual laws, for example, are not directly in scripture, but are human uh, development. Mm -hmm. And similarly in Christianity, there are doctrines, I instance the doctrine of the Trinity, which you can find in scripture. You can find it at the end of Matthew's gospel where the disciples are told to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you don't find a development of the doctrine of the Trinity as it came to be in later Christianity. And if you want to regard that as a really central Christian doctrine, you have to explain why it's so little attested in the New Testament. And there are other things in the New Testament, like justification by faith, which is crucially central for certainly 
Lutheran branch of Christianity, and yet which um, are, uh, are again present in the text, but in many versions of Christianity not made very much of. So there isn't an exact fit between the two. Mm -hmm. And does the Bible also stand for tolerance? And in general, are there as many ways of reading the Bible as there are faith communities? Well, there clearly, from an empirical point of view, are as many ways of reading the Bible as there are faith communities. So they will read it differently. Um, and in a way, the Bible is somewhat protean. It's, it's, it can sh change its shape to suit you. And sometimes said rather cynically, you can find anything you're looking for in this book because it's so large and complex. Um, but uh, I don't think that's necessarily strictly true. As to whether it's tolerant, whether it promotes tolerance, that is hard to find. I mean, all the authors of the Bible tend to be uh, rather dogmatic. Mm. And uh, certainly in the New Testament, you don't find an easy tolerance. You find Paul laying down the law, saying that certain things must be believed and done. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't find tolerance. You do find it perhaps in the wisdom literature of the, of the Hebrew Bible. The Proverbs has a lot of sayings which center more on the idea of tolerating other people and not being uh, too assertive to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But in general, it's not a very tolerant book. There's no doubt um, your book about the Bible has a real appeal character. You, you read some chapters and then, then you read the whole book. It's, it's so fantastic. There's also, the, the Bible has also a sort of appeal character that um, asks the people to read it. Oh, yes, that's right. I think it does. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I can't remember which English writer, I think it was Ruskin, who said the Bible is more interesting than any other book. <laughs> and that, that's not a view that's widely shared in society. I think most people think it's extremely boring. Um, and my attempt was to try and suggest that it is in fact a very interesting book without making the claim that it's the most interesting book in the world. But, it, but it, there are passages in it which the modern reader doesn't find very interesting. All the rules for sacrifice in Leviticus, for example. But in general, it seems to me it is a very interesting book, and I wanted to promote that idea. Mm -hmm. Who should read your book? Well, anyone who thinks they might be interested in the Bible. Uh, it doesn't require any faith commitment, as you see. Um, there, there are things in it about how the Bible is read and might be read by people of faith, but it doesn't require any commitment of a religious kind at all. It's just there for anyone who might find the Bible interesting and say, I would like to know a bit more about this very strange book which sits on my bookshelves, but which I never open. Thank you very, thank you very much, John Burton. Your book, Die Geschichte der Bibel von den Ursprüngen bis zur Gegenwart, has just been published by Klett Cotter in Stuttgart in Germany. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>